Good morning, church family. Uh, my name is Caleb Rhodes, and I am a resident here at Park Cities, uh, working with the adult ministries. If you're unsure of what the residency program is, basically there's five of us uh, that uh, have been brought in to learn how to do ministry um, at a deeper level, working with the church staff, getting more experiences uh, in order that we can grow in our uh, areas of giftedness and be sent out uh, to serve God better uh, throughout the world. So I'm excited to be here with you this morning. I'm excited to bring the word. I want to start by sharing a life-changing moment that happened to me back in January of 2015. At the time, we were living in Kentucky, my wife and I and our two daughters. Um, I'd served in the military, and so I was stationed at Fort Campbell. And uh, Catherine had went to North Carolina where we grew up because her uncle had died. So Catherine and the girls were in North Carolina. I was at home alone, and I was walking through our house. And as I was walking along, staring at the floor, thinking about nothing important that I remember, probably thinking about nothing, as you know, men do, we have a nothing box. Uh, the kitchen floor is tile. And as the kitchen floor transitions to the living room floor, it was hardwood. There was a, just a transition strip there, very typical. And for whatever reason, as I was walking through there, looking at the floor, as I saw that transition happen between the tile and the hardwood, God overwhelmed me with conviction for the way that I was living my life. Can't explain it, no idea, but that's the moment in which God can, you know, decided to overwhelm me with conviction. Now, I grew up in church, right, and so I knew what was right, but I wasn't living that way. I wouldn't say, you know, during my early and mid-20s that I was running away from God, but I definitely wasn't actively running to him either. And so in that moment, feeling overwhelmed with conviction for how I was living my life, I remember I just dropped to my knees and I cried out to God in prayer. And I asked him to forgive me for the way that I've been living my life, and I made him a promise. I promised him that that day I would go and buy a study Bible, and that I would commit the rest of my life to doing two things, to studying his word and growing closer in a relationship with him, and that I would help teach others how to do that as well. You know, I don't, I don't really know why in that moment I prayed, but I know that my first response to God's intervention in my life was prayer. I didn't really understand how it worked. I grew up in church, so I had words to say. It wasn't unfamiliar to me, but I didn't really know how it worked. I didn't really know why you did it. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Have you ever asked yourself questions like that? You know, prayer is a very basic activity for people. For those people who might consider themselves to be spiritual, they reach out to God in prayer daily or maybe weekly. But even for those people who wouldn't consider themselves to be spiritual, maybe you're sitting here and you say, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I don't even actually know if I believe that God exists. But I bet still, even in times of deep distress in your life, even if you don't follow through with it, I bet the thought crosses your mind to pray. Why is that? As children were taught to repeat simple prayers like, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, you know it, I pray the Lord my soul to take. On a separate note, as an adult, I'm still not sure how interjecting this idea of children dying in their sleep is supposed to help comfort them <laughs> as they go to sleep. We've changed the words to it in our house. I'll share that at another time. But we're, we're taught these simple prayers, right? Prayer in its very essence is a very elementary concept. The basic definition of prayer is talking to God. Yet prayer, when you really think about it, is such a complicated subject. Have you ever wondered how can human beings talk to the creator of the universe? How can God hear all these prayers at the same time and know what to do? You know, how do I, how do I pray? What is a good prayer? And what, what should I ask for? Are we only allowed to ask for our needs? God, give me just enough food this week so that I don't die. Or are we allowed to ask for things that we won't? Is that okay? Has anybody ever asked themselves these questions? I'm sure you have. I know I have. And I hope 
that over the past several weeks of our sermon series on prayer, you've gotten a lot of these questions answered. But what I want us to focus our attention on today is the question, why do I pray? Now, the title of the sermon is, Where Do I Pray? But what Jesus does in the passage is in a very unique way, by talking about where a disciple prays, he's getting at the heart of why a disciple prays. And we'll look at that. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 this morning. And as you're making your way to Matthew chapter 6, I want us to see three things from the passage. I want us to see the posture of prayer, the promise of prayer, and the place of prayer. The promise of prayer, I'm sorry, the posture of prayer, the promise of prayer, and the place of prayer. And then finally, I'll wrap us up with a practical application. What do I do with what I've just heard? So let me set the context for you here. Matthew chapter 6 is part of a larger section of scripture in Matthew known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out what a true disciple of his should look like. In other words, he's given the ultimate ethic for those who wish to participate in the kingdom of God. And so chapter 6 is deliberately divided up into three different sections here by Matthew. The first section, the first four verses, talks about almsgiving. The second section, where we're going to be this morning, talks about prayer. And this section includes the Lord's Prayer that we spent so much time in. And then the final section, verses 16 through 18, it talks about fasting. And each of these three sections cover a topic that was considered to be an essential part of a Jew's spiritual life. They were expected to give to the needy, almsgiving. They were expected to pray regularly. And they were expected to occasionally fast from food in order to demonstrate their sincere devotion to God. Now, I want to be clear that the text here does not say, if you pray, if you fast, if you give. The text says, when you do these things. So the expectation in the text is that as a disciple, you are already doing these things. Each of these things are commanded of the Jewish people many times throughout Scripture. They're told to give, they're told to pray, and they're told to fast. So if Jesus' audience was already so familiar with these topics, why is it that he would choose to address them again? Perhaps he has something deeper to say about these actions. And in fact, he does. And we're going to dig into that specifically here in Matthew chapter 6 to see what Jesus has to say about prayer from these verses. Read with me, beginning in uh, verse 1. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So the first thing that I want us to see from this passage this morning is that there is a definite posture to prayer. So I have two daughters. They're nine and seven. And my oldest daughter, Chastin, plays basketball. And so if you know anything about me, you know that I am competitive to my core. I mean, even at home with my wife, who is as non-competitive as it comes, well, when we're doing house chores, I'll be like, I'll get the living room sweep before you get the kitchen sweep. And she's like... I don't really care how fast you get it sweeped as long as you do it right, right? And so, but that's who I am, right? I'm so competitive. And when my daughter was old enough to start playing sports, I was pumped. Are there any other parents that can relate to that? Are there any, are there any spouses who that makes them super anxious that their other half is that competitive? If my wife were here, she would raise her hand. So we made sure that my oldest daughter, Chastin, had new basketball shoes. She had a brand new basketball great leather grip. We made sure she had a new basketball goal. I even tried to make her watch basketball with me on TV. That didn't work, but that's okay. We did all the right things, but when it came time for her to play in her first game, I noticed that something was wrong. As I was sitting there on the sidelines, yelling at her, coaching from the stands, which I shouldn't have been doing, but I was doing anyways, I realized that even though she had all this right equipment, she still wasn't getting any time with the ball. She wasn't getting any chance to shoot. She wasn't getting any rebounds. And I'm sitting there going, 
what is going on? What is wrong with this picture? She had all the right training, but she didn't get a chance to touch the ball. And then it hit me. I realized that I had been yelling at her the whole time this phrase. I had been yelling at her without even realizing it to get into position. Hey, get in position. Get the rebound. Get in position. Get the pass. But what I didn't realize is that she had no idea what I was talking about. I had played basketball for so many years that this phrase had become ingrained in my head and I was telling her to do something that she didn't know what to do. She didn't know how to get in position. Like basketball, the posture of prayer is all about a fight for position. Now, I'm not talking about a physical position, you know, being on your knees or holding your hands a certain way. I'm talking about the posture of your heart. Asking yourself, what are your motives? Why am I praying? Jesus says in verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. If I could put a title on the main idea that Jesus is getting at in the whole of chapter 6, talking about almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, if I could kind of sum it up in one phrase, this is what it would be. Avoid performance-based religiosity. Avoid performance-based religiosity. You know, we are always so quick to rush to the what and the how of prayer. And I'm sure many of you have heard it over and over again if you've grown up in church. How do I pray? What do I say? But we're so quick to overlook the why behind our prayer. And that's exactly where Jesus starts. Here in these verses, Jesus starts with the why. He wants us to examine the why behind what we are praying. But that requires a deep dive into our hearts and our motives. Now, I know that can be a scary place for many of us. It is for me oftentimes. And Jesus makes this point clear here by comparing the motives of the hypocrites to what the motives of his disciples should look like. Now, when Jesus makes reference to the hypocrites, he's talking about the Jewish religious elite of the day. You hear him called several names throughout the New Testament, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. He's talking about them, and he has categorized them as being hypocrites here. Now, this Greek word where our word hypocrite comes from means actor or stage performer. And over time, this word took on an extended meaning to refer to any person who was wearing a figurative mask or pretending to be someone or something that they're not. Do you know anybody like that? If you don't, it's probably you. But Jesus' problem is not with the actions of these religious leaders. It's not that they were praying or giving or fasting. It's about why they were doing it. It's with the motives behind their actions. You know, one part of the Jewish faith was that you would have regular times of prayer spread out throughout the day. One way in which these religious elites were showing their hypocrisy is that they would schedule out their times of prayer to just so happen be in public places. They would find themselves, you know, on aisle three of Tom Thumb or at the corner of Villanova out here right at the time that they were supposed to pray. And they would begin with these benevolent, benevolent luscious prayers to God out loud. And Jesus says, don't be like them. He's not saying don't pray like they pray. He's saying don't do it with the motives and intentions that they have because their motive is to be seen by people. Jesus was adamantly against this type of perverse expression of piety. These religious elite thought that they were setting the standard of religious reverence, but Jesus was pointing out their hidden hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and religiosity, they bind to this belief that my performance gets me something. And our culture here in America and in Dallas teaches us that my performance earns me something. I deserve that because I worked hard. But that's not what scripture teaches. And that's not what the gospel says. The gospel says that it is faith that triumphs over our works. And the only performance that matters is the performance of Jesus Christ on the cross. On the cross, Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of devotion and love, and he did it with pure, undiluted motivation for two things, obedience to God the Father and love 
for us. It's Christ's performance that matters. It's not my performance, and it's not your performance. And it's your faith in his performance, in his perfect life, his death, and his resurrection that is the only true hope that exists both in this life and the next. And until you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, hear me say this, you cannot have an effective prayer life with God. The message this morning, the text, what the text is saying, it's speaking to those people who already identify as followers of Jesus. You cannot have an effective relationship with God in prayer unless you have first established your relationship through faith with Jesus Christ. In order to pray effectively, we first examine the motives of our heart. We ask God to reveal any sinful motives that might be there. Then we ask his forgiveness of those. We repent, and he's faithful to do that. He's faithful to forgive us. So just like my daughter playing basketball, if we do not put ourselves in a proper position for prayer, then we will never experience it to the fullest extent that it was meant to be experienced. As my daughter got better at basketball and she started understanding how the game was meant to be played, she began to enjoy it so much more. Without a heart that is properly postured for prayer, we're really no better than the hypocrites that Jesus is calling out in this text. We're seeking self-righteous glory for ourselves. What is your motive for praying? Why are you praying? So we've seen the posture of prayer. Let's move on to the promise of prayer. Verse five says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. The promise Jesus gives us in these verses is this. At the end of verse 6, he says, If you pray from a posture of humility so that your only intentions is an intimate personal communication with God, then God will reward you for that. Honest question. Does that excite you when you hear it? Have you considered maybe does that terrify you? You're thinking, Caleb, why would it terrify me that God would reward me for something? Well, because the reality of it is that God knows all and God sees all. And not only does God know everything that we do, God knows our motives and our intentions behind what we say and do. And I can tell you, as a husband, just one example, as a husband, there's things that I've said to my wife over the course of our 11-year marriage that what I said and what I thought were not the same thing. But I said it because I knew I was supposed to love her, even if I didn't feel like doing it in the moment. I said it. But God knew the intentions of my heart that was behind that. Essentially, Jesus here is leaving his audience. He's leaving us with two options. He's asking us the question, would you rather have earthly recognition from other men and women, or would you rather have eternal rewards from your Father in heaven? That's what's at stake when we consider the motivations of our heart in prayer. Now, let me be clear here what Jesus is not promising. Jesus is not saying that every time we go to God in prayer that we're going to get an award from God. It's not what he's saying. In fact, the reward here is not the focus at all. Jesus' focus is on the motivations of the person doing the prayer. He says, if you, your desire is to be heard by God and to experience intimate connection with him, then God will honor that. But if your desire is to be recognized by your peers, by your church leaders, by your bosses, etc., if that is your desire, then God will withdraw his attention from you and all you will be left with are the empty accolades of other people. The emphasis in the text is not on what you will receive as, an, as a reward, but the emphasis of the text is on what you will certainly not receive if you enter into prayer with twisted and warped motivations. Let me put it another way. In the kingdom of God, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons is worthless. You can tweet that. Let me say it again. In the kingdom of God, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons is worthless. 
but doing the right thing for the right reasons is priceless. Consider what are you doing right now in your life with the wrong intentions? Now, I want you to know, I want to be very clear that I'm grouping myself in with the crowd when I ask these questions. But why did you show up to church this morning? Did you show up because your parents expected you to? Did you show up because you didn't want to hear your spouse nag about another Sunday morning you decided to sleep in instead of come to church? Maybe you showed up because this is a great place to find business connections or a date. Maybe you're one of those truly awful people that showed up because after the service, you want people to come up and tell you what an amazing preacher you are. Don't be those people. You know, why are some people going to show up here on Easter Sunday? They're going to take a few pictures in their new outfits, and then they're not going to come back until Christmas. The question is, are you being motivated in your relationship to God? Are you being motivated by devotion to him? Or are you being motivated by public perception? And only you can answer that question. Now, sure, our intentions are never going to be perfect. But the big question is that Jesus is implying in the text, is the focus of your relationship with God more on you or on him? Now, I happen to know a couple in our church who gave an extremely generous donation. And they gave it in secret. They gave it anonymously. And the only reason that I know about this donation is because I'm directly impacted by it. Now, this couple would never want you to know their name. What may surprise you, though, is that you also know about this donation. You just might not be aware of it. The very reason that I am able to stand before you this morning on this stage and be a part of this residency program is because of the generous donation of that one couple. They funded the program because they bought into the vision that the leadership had for raising up leaders here for the body of Christ at Park Cities for the next generation. And they said, I want to invest in that. I believe that there's more people just like that couple here in our congregation that you're capable and you've been gifted to pray fearlessly. You've been given the responsibility with the resources to give generously, but you have yet to live in that calling on your life from God. If that's you, I want to challenge you to begin that today. I want you to give a generous gift to someone this week. Never tell another soul about it. I want you to spend time in prayer at your home, at your office, wherever that is. Intentionally spend time in private prayer, praying for someone this week and never tell anybody about it. Practice proper motivations. Practice private prayer. Now I'm venturing to guess that for some of you here today, the question is not, do I pray with the right motives? The question really is, do I even pray? You find yourself maybe Sunday to Sunday looking back over the week going, man, I don't, I don't know that I actually prayed at all this week. You know, I got busy. I forgot. I didn't really think about it. I want you to know that if that's you, in fact, anyone who is listening right now who has failed to meet the righteous expectations of our God in prayer, and let's be honest, that's all of us, that hope is not lost we serve a God of abundant grace, and right here, right now, God is waiting on you to open up a line of communication with him because as a good father, his desire is to hear from his children and his desires that his children want to hear from him. Knowing that the recognition from God is reward enough. We've seen the posture of prayer. We've seen the promise of prayer. Finally, Let's look at the place of prayer. We've talked at length about the why behind our prayer. Let's see what Jesus says in verse six about where we should pray. It says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. So what is Jesus telling his disciples to do here? Are we only supposed to pray in secret? Are we not supposed to pray publicly? If that's the case, we have really messed up this morning. That's not what Jesus is saying. This is an important lesson when studying scripture. Remember this, context is key. 
You can't take a verse that says, go and pray in secret and say, oh, this is my verse. I never have to pray in public. I've got my verse in my pocket. If anyone asks me to pray, I'll say, nope, I'm not supposed to do that. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus is teaching, like I said, again, in the, the broader context of the Sermon on the Mount, the proper ethic for kingdom discipleship. And in this particular passage, Jesus is teaching his disciples to examine the motivations of their heart when they are practicing acts of religious devotion. And he illustrates how this principle plays out in a true disciple's life by contrasting the public attention-seeking prayers of the hypocrites with the private heartfelt prayers of a true disciple. We know that Jesus is not forbidding public prayer here because in a few verses, Jesus teaches us how to pray by doing what? By praying out loud in public, the Lord's prayer. He's teaching this. So we know he's not forbidding public prayer. And there's definitely times when prayer in the company of others is appropriate. So for example, I try to pray with my girls every morning before they go to school, try. I try to pray with them before our meals, and at night when they go to bed. It's an important practice. It's essential in, my, in our home that our girls see me and Catherine praying because how else are they gonna learn how to do it? Now, do I mess up sometimes or say something silly that completely derails the whole prayer and makes everyone laugh? Of course I do. What kind of dad would I be if I didn't throw a dad joke in there every now and then, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to be irreverent, but God has a sense of humor. He created us, right? And so praying doesn't always have to be this very sincere, stoic thing. Teaching our kids to pray and to love communication with God. God is not listening for a string of perfect words or a certain formula. God desires our heartfelt communication with him as we seek to align our will, or his will, excuse me, in our lives. And here's the secret. There's a time and a place for prayer. And if you have a pen, write this down. This is the secret to prayer. You can pray anytime, anywhere. Or like I tell my kids, you can pray every time, everywhere. Every time you think about it, everywhere you are at. But if you are not practicing regularly, private, intimate prayer with God, then your life will reflect it. You know, I have days where I get to the end of my day and I realize that I've prayed for my girls several times or I've prayed with them, but I haven't spent any personal, intimate time with God myself. And that truly does impact my day. It impacts my relationship with Catherine, how I speak to her. It impacts how I react to different situations. It, it impacts what I think and what I say in the safety of my car when the silver Malibu cuts me off on 75 when I'm trying to get somewhere. It impacts things. And it impacts my relationship with my heavenly father. You know, think about it. If a plumber shows up to your house to do some handiwork and he hasn't touched his tools a single time since he graduated trade school, do you think that would be evident in his craftsmanship? Of course it would. You and your spouse live in the same house, but you never really talk to each other. You give each other the occasional shout out on Instagram for, what is it, Man Crush Thursday or whatever it is, or Valentine's Day, but you never really have any deep communication between the two of you. Is that a healthy relationship? Is that really even a relationship at all? Oswald Chambers said it best. The reality is it is impossible to carry on your life as a disciple without definite times of secret prayer. So returning to my story that I began with, I've learned a lot since that uh, moment of God's intervention in my life back in 2015. But I know that I'll never have a perfect track record when it comes to prayer. And you know what? Neither will you. But I've got good news. God does not require perfection from any of us. Jesus fulfilled our requirement of perfection on the cross. And through faith in his sacrifice, we have received his perfection. You know, like watching my daughter play basketball, I expect imperfection from her. I expect her not to get it right. What I desire is her heartfelt commitment and love motivated by the game and by her love for me. And the same is true of our Heavenly Father. He desires our imperfect effort and commitment, but only if it's motivated by true devotion and love for him. You know why God uses imperfect people? 
because that's all he's got. We're all imperfect people. So we've seen the posture of prayer, the promise of prayer, and the place of prayer. I want to wrap it up here with a, an application. What, what do you do with what you've just heard? In light of the importance of private prayer, I want to leave you with a challenge. We're going into the Lenten season here. I want to challenge you, starting today, to spend 10 minutes every day in personal private prayer with God. Set aside a place in your home, in your office, in your car, wherever it is that you're away from the distractions of kids, of the television, of your colleagues. Set aside a place and be intentional to spend 10 minutes per day in prayer. Now, that might seem like a big number for some of you. If you're not used to praying, if it's not a regular practice for you, it might seem like a large number. But ask yourself why that is. Commit to private prayer with God. So as we close the service, I want to do something somewhat irregular, but I think it's important for people in the congregation to see the guy up front being vulnerable and being honest. So I just want to give you a peek behind the curtain of what a personal private prayer moment might look like in my life between me and God. And I don't do this because I've got it all figured out or because I'm the perfect example but I think it's helpful and it's encouraging to see other people as they struggle through their walk of faith, to see that demonstrated and see what that looks like. So I'm gonna pray just a bit. And then after I'm done, I'm going to give you guys some guided prompts um, as you spend time in private prayer yourself. Just a moment, things to think through. And then I'll close this out by praying over us. So will you pray with me? Father God, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be here uh, to preach at Park Cities. Lord, as the psalmist says, search my heart and know me. And I ask God that you would search my heart as you have this week. As I prepared the message, you know that I wrestled with pride. I wrestled with a desire to be seen as a great communicator. I don't want to be seen as someone who stands up here and is not articulate and can't get his words out. Looks like he hasn't prepared. Lord, and you know that, that the pride of public perception was, was real in my life this week. And as I asked you to forgive me for that, God, I pray that that, that wasn't a hindrance to your word doing its work and that your spirit um, would continue to move among the people. Lord, thank you for your blessings in my life. I'm truly undeserving of them. As you pray, ask God to reveal the motivations of your heart. Ask him to reveal something to you that you're doing for the wrong reasons. Then ask him to forgive you of that and to help you avoid those temptations that place yourself in priority over him. Pray that he would give you strength to commit to these times of public prayer or private prayer over the next several weeks. And he will be faithful to do that. Father God, I, I lift up each person that's here this morning to you. I pray, God, that your word would convict their hearts and would cause life change to happen. Lord, I pray that you would meet each person here at the point of their greatest need. Lord, you are a God of grace and you are a God of wisdom. We ask that you guide and direct our lives and that you keep us from the temptation of placing ourselves in priority over you and that you would give us motivation to serve you, not for the glory of others, but so that you may be glorified through us. And it's in Jesus' name.